His voice is just grand. He gives you the check. You give him a hand. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. This week we have three of the brightest lights on Broadway, and they're all appearing in curtains. Here to introduce them, my co-host, Michael Beadle of the New York Post. I love <laughs> curtains. It's an absolutely delightful musical comedy by John Kander and Fred Ebb, Peter Stone and Rupert Holmes. And it does feature three of our favorite Broadway performers, the brilliantly talented, beautiful, and witty Karen Ziemba. Thank you. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. David Hyde Pierce, who is so marvelous and funny in Spamalot and who just makes dancing and singing seem so effortless in curtains. Welcome to Theater Talk. Great, Michael. I love watching you because I feel when I see you do the nice big dance number in the show, I too could get up there and attempt it as well. That's the idea, make everyone feel like, oh, if he can do it, then we can do it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and uh, I don't even know how to introduce my old friend Edward Hibbert. It's so nice to see you again. You, uh, you, you, you eat the scenery, you <laughs> eat the audience, you eat the theater. <laughs> uh, brilliantly funny as a camp director in curtains. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is really kind of, this show is kind of a throwback to the great old style of musical comedies that I think we all fell in love with. Uh, Karen, you've been working on this show for how long now? Have you done I workshops of it here I there? did one reading of this show last year, last fall, I believe, and I'm um, with these two guys. And since then, I've been involved with it. And then, of course, we did it at the Amundsen, uh, mm -hmm. at the Center Theater Group in Los Angeles this past summer. But So it's only been about a little over a year I've been involved with it mm -hmm, altogether. Mm -hmm. And you you were involved in it for a bit longer though, right? Slightly yeah. longer. I did two workshops. It's, it's a pro progression here. You'll see when you get to Edward, it's like ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I had done, when I was here doing Spamalot, Scott, had, Scott Ellis, our director, had asked me about curtains before Spamalot uh, came along and Freddie was still alive at that point and I think his death delayed um, the whole thing going forward, which allowed me to do spam a lot and then ultimately come to this. But right. yeah, so I had done two workshops, uh, one in the spring, I think, and one in the fall. Mm -hmm. And now going back to ancient history, Edward. <laughs> yeah, it is ancient. <laughs> this history. show has had six years. Deb Monk and I and Michael McCormack, who plays Oscar, mm -hmm. all assembled to do a reading of a show called Curtains. And as we've gone on this extraordinary journey, I look back and I think there is, ve I mean, the idea of a show biz loving detective was there mm -hmm. but the show's gone through enormous changes since then yeah and um i remember writing a column about curtains i think once a year right. i'd write a yeah. column <laughs> about how funny the workshop was right. a workshop was of the new john Cantor fred Ebb musical and i remember deb monk telling to me when we we're having lunch before we did yet another presentation she said i think this is either going to be the next step, oh, we're just going to finish it right here. And then a lot of sadness happened, as we know. We yes. had two huge losses. We lost, lost Fred, of course. Peter Stone yeah. Dear left friend of ours, first. Yeah. yeah, and then Fred, at which point I remember thinking, well, it's curtains for curtains. And then out of sorrow comes joy. Scott Ellis called and said, we're going back to the drawing board. Rupert Holmes has come on board. And guess what? David Hyde Pierce. Ah. And then guess what? Karen Ziemba. So this has been a joy. And I mean... No, I still sometimes just stand there, listen to that overture, which is such yeah, yeah. a joy every night. And then I go, you can't forget what an incredible journey this mm. has been. Yeah. There's so many great spirits still with us. I mean, I, I just feel that both Fred and Peter are, are looking down. What's rather nice is on the set, you know that whole backstage yeah. facsimile, we actually have a... a um, I forget whose idea it was, but um, it, was Scott. it says, Scott Ellis. Yeah. Yeah. it just says what well, we love you, Peter, we love you, Fred. So yes. they're there every night. Oh, really? Just, I mean, yeah. you can, There's on graffiti the on the set, like right. supposedly from all the actors who've worked in this, the Colonial oh, Theater all yeah, these years, yeah. and amongst the graffiti is yeah. uh, some farewells to them. Now, this is a very tricky thing to pull off, though, because it is a musical comedy. At the same time, it's a mystery thriller. And I remember. Peter himself always saying to me, the hard thing about this show was, if you're writing a musical, you only essentially have about 55 minutes to tell the story because mm. the rest is singing and dancing. Right. Now, try to tell the story that's a mystery plot. Has it been, have you been in there for the complexity of working this out? 
Yes, yeah. espe and especially David, because so much of what, so much of his dialogue is the exposition and figuring out, investigating the murder, uh, murders. Mm. Well, I shouldn't say that, <laughs> should I? I'm <laughs> giving it away. No one dies. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> Rupert's work on this show is just exemplary, and it's mm. so you. The audience laughs from the first line that's said to the last line that's said. It's just, mm. and I remember before we had an audience, we didn't know what we had, and. Once they showed up, it was like, oh, my God, this is funny. Mm -hmm. And we always thought it was funny ourselves, but to actually hear that coming back at you and then also it being very tender and then these, the dancing and the singing, the, the, the score, it's just all of it's like, it's overwhelming. But you have, you, I mean, you really have a, a very difficult thing, which I think you pull off quite well, uh, in that you've got these big production numbers, but then things have to stop because the mystery plot kicks in, and that's you. I mean, you have long yeah. stretches of yeah. having to uh, explain to us all that's going on. Right. Particularly difficult challenge, I guess, uh, in the midst of this musical I, comedy. I think the challenge was more for Rupert uh, than it was for me because if he hadn't done his job so well, I'd really be, uh, you know, stuck with a whole lot of talking that's not very interesting and a lot of facts and this or or whatever. And he. From the beginning, but also with Scott's help and, and through this winnowing process of, of putting it all together, has so found what we need to know, what we don't need to know, mm -hmm. how to sort of put out the red herrings uh, just enough, and how to do that interweaving that you're talking about of having a, first of all, putting a, writing a mystery for the stage is hard anyway. Very difficult. Writing a musical for the stage is a ridiculous thing <laughs> that no one should do. And then to put them together is like, well, just go shoot yourself. Right. He's written a very complicated murder plot, which, when you actually go back and you rewind, makes total sense. Everything gets tied up. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact there are some nights when, especially at matinees, uh, when a certain developments climactically come to pass, you hear, ooh, they love trying to get there ahead of time, you know? Yeah, yeah and you really think you know who did it, and you're wrong. And you're wrong. That's great. But he's yeah. also, Rupert, has done you know, this incredible job of writing this wonderfully funny Valentine to our world. Right. Now, I'm curious to know, because, uh, as you said, Peter uh, was a good friend of ours. He was on the show all the time, just because he was so hugely entertaining. <laughs> you know, just come on, and <laughs> off you'd go, and he'd say the funniest things. He was wonderful. Do I, is there much of Peter Stone's work left in the book? I, there are sometimes where I detect showbiz jokes that I think only, that's a Peter Stone joke. Why? Or is it all now just been sort it's of It's very hard to give you a percentage. I mean, certainly the murder mystery bears no relation. To what the Peter musical we were doing in Curtains originally was not a Wild West musical. Mm. It was a kind of comedia musical. Um, so in essence, Rupert's done a huge amount of work on it. Um, I think a few... The wisecracks. A few showbiz zingers yeah. of Peter's have been maintained, which I think is lovely. It's mm -hmm. kind of yeah. p for posterity's sake, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And, I'm sorry? You I was just going to say, and the characters, some mm -hmm. of the, uh, the uh, central characters Although a lot are... of characters have gone. I mean, Jessica didn't... I, can I, I can say Who's that. Jessica? The leading lady of the show did not die in one of our versions. Right. Someone so was someone trying to died? kill her. Michelle Lee played it, and she went right through the show. Um, and then after and, she did it, they said, well, we need to kill off this character. And there was a very, very funny character of a lesbian German costume designer who was... <laughs> That's Peter all over. <laughs> That's a Peter Stone's who, signature character. Who um, clearly had a rather complicated interest in the leading ladies. So, no, there were characters that went. But, right. Or, I mean, jo Georgia, I think, Casey's character, yeah. didn't actually, in the earliest drafts, ever become um, the leading lady of the show. Right. Uh, but the characters, all three of us, and, and the role that Deborah plays, and, and most of the featured parts are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, your characters, uh, a lot of the characters in the show are showbiz types, except you, you're the, the detective. Mm. Um, He's the most showbizy of all. He is the most. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you know, everyone who's not in show business wants to be in That's show right. business, which <laughs> is precisely what, what you are. Um, Let's see, are you channeling John Dexter in your performance? Somebody asked me if I was, <laughs> and I'll tell you. I think the great British director. it's an amalgamation <laughs> of a lot of high-maintenance, <laughs> cruel English directors who seem to flourish in a time when I was still living there. I mean, certain names um, will be kept from the show, but you know, the royal court had a group of very, very 
uh, brilliant and mean-spirited um, <laughs> directors. And I mean, I, I, that's why I love the part I play, because although it may seem like a caricature of, some, of some how, how, how vicious he can be, yeah. actually, a lot of them are and were like that. Mm -hmm. I think English directors particularly. And is there a sense of a bit of Betty Comden at all in oh, what, you, what you're doing? Yeah. I knew Betty, and there was something about her, whenever you talked to her, she'd say, she'd make some wisecrack, and then she, her eyes would go like this. She didn't move a whole lot, but she just had this like expressive <laughs> yeah. face, and was so urbane, and also was a former performer herself, mm, right, and singer, right. so there's that in there too, and just a really cool. All lady. right, and what, you're Miss Marple, Hercule Poirot? <laughs> I, you know, I, we tried to make sure I wasn't any of the detectives that anyone knew. And fortunately, again, because of the, the part that they wrote, this guy who's a, a detective but loves musicals, I guess there's the singing detective, but I don't have leprosy. So yeah, it's, no, it's a uh, fresh character. I mean, it's a character it really you haven't is. seen. Yeah. Yeah. Although Before. there's shades of our favorite, Columbo. Yes. Well, yeah, well, I love Columbo. And I, right, I, I, in the most endearing way. It's not you're doing him at all, but there's right. something about that sort of normal Well, I enter in a trench coat, but I get out of it as quickly yes. as I can. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah. never say, and just one more thing. That's true, I never And do. Peter Falk <laughs> does not sing and dance as well as you do. Well, I don't know. He, uh, Robin in the Seven Hoods, remember that? Oh, God, he was in that. Good point. Frank Sinatra. I, I don't remember if Peter danced in that, but he was a <laughs> singing gangster, I think. Oh, well, uh, uh, to the DVD shop yes. to rent that one. Yes. Listen, Kurt, Curtains is a delightful, delightful show at the, um, uh, I want to say the Martin Beck, but it's the Al Hirschfeld now, of course, starring Karen Ziemba, David Hyde Pierce, and Edward Hibbert. Good luck with the show, and thanks for being our guest tonight on Theatre Talk. Thanks, guys. Nice. Nice. Glad to be here. Dreamed there was an angel who could hear me through the wall As I cried out like in Latin, this is so not life at all Help me out, out of this nightmare, then I heard her silver call She said, just give it time, kid, I come to one and all Susan and I just love the musical Spring Awakening, which we are certain is going to be nominated for all kinds of awards this spring. It really has, I think, the most beautiful score I've heard on Broadway in a good 10 or 15 years, and we are very happy tonight to have with us Duncan Sheik, who wrote the music to this terrific musical. Thank you. Duncan, welcome. Thank you. Your, uh, your co-conspirator, your lyricist, yes. Stephen Sater, was on here earlier, and he said a, f a few weeks ago, and he said that um, this is not an overnight success, that the <laughs> road to Spring Awakening mm. was a very long, mm. long one, uh, fraught with all sorts of twists and turns. Yes. Now, you came from uh, the pop, pop music business, yeah. where you kind of write, you know, what, a few songs, do an album, and it comes out, I guess, fairly quickly. Yeah, it's a, it, you know, making record. I mean, the longest I've gone between records is four years, and that was, and that's very long. Usually, the album cycle is about two years, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because, and usually half of that is touring behind the previous album, and then it takes about a year to put one together. But you know, working on a project for what ended up being eight years was a, <laughs> a new, new experience for when, me. When you're in the midst of, do you ever think, you know, what is the point of writing a musical? Am I going to just write this for the rest of my life, and it's never going to oh, get on? I mean, you don't know how many times in that room in the workshop with you know 11 actors there and I'm going this is never going to work and what am I doing here <laughs> like, like how how is this ever going to become something that anybody wants to see so what but, have you moving well I you know I think I, well, I think Stephen you know is 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 so positive and so you know and he really feels things really deeply and so I think a lot you know a lot of it was carried on his kind of energy and his excitement about it and 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 then eventually it I I, I then there's certain things that happened in those workshops when I when you saw just a moment of like oh that's the thing right you know this like, is what it can be oh I like oh I got it you know and then you know finally it was like Really, finally, when that this was the first day we walked into the Atlantic Theater when the sets were up, mm. and the boys did they weren't in costume yet, but the boys were rehearsing Bitch of Living with Bill yeah. T, and Great that song, yeah. and that was the moment when Steve and I and we kind of like went like this to each other and we were like That's big it. grin yeah. like. This is <laughs> this is going to be cool. Eight years, but <laughs> finally we're here. Yeah. There's a moment. Now, yeah. were so. you a you, you weren't a great musical theater lover before you entered into this well, here's arena, a, were you? I have an odd 
history with it because you know when I was a kid, I think maybe we talked about this. I did do a lot of musical theater. That's right. Yeah. Um, and my you know my mom was always you know I did a lot of community theater. I was Jim in Treasure Island, and I was uh, you know uh, the Artful Dodger and Oliver in school, and I was even Gonzo in the Muppet movie. You know that was my probably my biggest most important role. The real Muppet movie you were no no, no the, the, in, <laughs> the, in, the, in, at school we oh, did the a school Muppet movie the high school musical yeah. <laughs> of, uh, you know that was my first so my first singing solo on stage in fourth grade. So you know and then even in college like I did I actually did as as is not in college in high school I went to Andover and mm -hmm. we, we I, and I was in that play and I actually and I played guitar and Godspell and then so you were around the musical theater well I was but you know but it's funny I never I didn't I didn't feel I wasn't like part of the drama the crew mm -hmm. at Brown but I did like I played guitar there was a musical about William Blake called Tiger that was really bad but but, I, <laughs> but, I, but Lisa Loeb and I were in the pit band and that's oh, how yeah. I met Lisa oh, how interesting. so um, you know so that was cool and but were you listening to Stephen Sondheim uh, cast albums all the time and singing Jerry no. Herman tunes no. no I no I mean I I my mom took me to Sweeney Todd when I was 10 there were aspects of it that I of course was thrilled by mm -hmm. and there were aspects of it that I always felt yeah, what know. didn't you like about musical theater, and did you consciously try to avoid those things in the musical theater that you didn't like for Ab Spring Awakening? Absolutely. I mean, that such was, as well, you know, this is true not not only of of Spring Awakening, but of of even my own work as a as a performer. I'm not like the the entertainment side of the business was never interesting to me like i don't i mean like when i'm going to play a concert myself i don't like get up there and dance around and try and like you know flash and if, razzle make, dazzle yeah that it's just no I, sequence no very there's very little gold lame in my shows <laughs> but i you know but and and, and so you know I, I, when i'm also in theater too i feel like i want you know i want the audience to be moved but on a Hopefully, a really deep, profound level, and not on the level of, oh, isn't that darling, or isn't that, oh, that was a nice evening's light entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I, I understand why that theater exists, and I think it's great that it exists, and people love that, and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, what I'm interested in are things that maybe have a little more, you know, gravitas. Mm, interesting nourishment. Well, f yeah, for me. Yeah. You and I spoke uh, when you called me on the phone after, uh, I guess, a couple of months ago. We had a nice conversation, and I was interested in, you know, because, you know, I am of that sort of showbiz razzle-dazzle right. oh, kind of you, thing. Yeah. So to me, your score was just so uh, fresh and, and vibrant and, and, and meditative and beautiful. How can you describe the influences on this score of Spring mm -hmm. Awakening? I mean, I was trying, I was writing a column, and I couldn't, I couldn't come up with the words yeah. to describe what sure. this sound is, so I asked you. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I my influences are English kind of art rock for lack of a better word mm -hmm. of a certain era so but but I'll, kind of going back into the 70s like obviously people like Nick Drake and 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 kind of the folk, the English kind of folk artists where there are these very orchestrated folk songs mm -hmm. that they would do and then you know things when I was in my early teens I listened to like you know King Crimson and mm -hmm. and Genesis and Peter Gabriel and all that kind yeah. of stuff and then and then that kind of morphed into things that were a little more, less prog rock and more kind of art rock. So I don't know if you know who David Sylvian is. He was the lead singer of a band called Japan. It's a little obscure. You know this, Susan? I do, yes. Da yeah, and he, David Sylvian worked a lot with Ryuichi Sakamoto, who, you know, is the great composer of mm -hmm. um, The Last Emperor. And, you know, oh, yeah. Um, it just, you know, so it was kind of that, it was through kind of English art rock that I kind of, I would hear these people who were really c great composers and mm -hmm. arrangers and orchestrators, and that was always the stuff that I was excited by. Mm -hmm. You know, even you know, even when I was this, you know, whether it was Depeche Mode or Psychedelic Furs or Talk Talk or what, you know, it was those moments where things would be, the arrangements would be really yeah. kind of sophisticated. That's that's what always kind of turned me on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I, that's where I, musically I come from, and Spring Awakening. I was quite strict with myself initially about, you know, saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I think Stephen Sondheim is amazing, but I don't come from that tradition, so I need to be true to who I am. I'm not going to try and 
ape someone else's style, mm. you know, because that I, I just I think. And it, you had to consciously say that to yourself because you thought writing musical I could slip into writing in the Richard Rogers Sondheim kind of. Well, I, I you know I was that was less danger of that because Stephen you know he writes the lyrics first. Stephen Sater. Yeah, Stephen yeah, Sater. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I haven't you know, I haven't worked with Stephen Sondheim yet. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to compose. He should only be so lucky. <laughs> Stephen Sondheim should only be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but um, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, Stephen usually writes the lyrics first. So I'm not starting off with material that is in that in that universe to begin with, you mm. know. So and his Stephen's words are so kind of poetic and and they have a can have a kind of ephemeral quality to them, you know. Yeah, they so, very much so. Yeah. So the music then is is comes out of that, you know, and. Um, so I, th it's I'm lucky in that respect where I'm not necessarily, you know, Stephen doesn't write like witty repartee. That's not kind of what he does. I mean, right. some of it's really funny, yeah. But it's but it still all has a kind of, you know, a, a depth to it that it's very that, profound. That yeah. I respond to. Oh, it's yeah. beautiful. Oh. Beautiful. Among those many many gems in the album, there's a song that I just love, which is. Um, that's a funny. It's, it's interesting you say Stephen's titles often elude me. They, they, they do. They, me can't. too. I forget them all. We call them seven different things, but before we know what the actual title. Yeah, of the I, song I, I can is. never remember the title. But well, it's the song that when the the, bo the boy has died and the, they sing um, um, the, fu the funeral. The song? funeral song. Left that, behind. Left behind. That yeah. is a gorgeous song. Yeah, it's really my, for for a very long time. I mean, I Left Behind and Don't Do Sadness Blue Wind are hands down my favorite two mm -hmm. kind of pieces of music in the show. Can you give us a sense for a song like Left Behind? And do you remember the process of writing that song and how you got mm -hmm. the melody for that? And I mean, Stephen presents you with this mm -hmm. well, sad lyric about yeah. a father singing, you know, the Saturdays you'll never have with yes. him again, all those things. Yeah. Well, in, in fact, that, you know, I do a lot with alternate guitar tunings and I had this kind of I think in that case I had the the beginnings of a piece of music using this kind of strange, t very kind of droney tuning. It's almost like like a tuning the guitar like a cello, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, um, so like kind of in fifths instead of fourths and droning strings. And I just found this kind of motif. And and I was at the time I was living in Chinatown with a friend of mine. My my place was being built. So and and my friend's mom. Was there? Who's this? You know, my my best friend's mom was, you know, sitting at the kitchen table, mm -hmm. and I had this lyric, and I had come up with this thing, and I and I kind of played it for her badly because I I just I hadn't really, you know, I hadn't got it in, in my voice yeah. yet, but you know, and she just started crying, you know, mm -hmm. and that at that moment, so I kind of knew, you know, what even though my performance wasn't so good, you knew there you was something, something in the song. You know, Do you compose was, on a guitar or piano? Both, but I, I think. I, I would say on Spring Awakening, it's about mm, 60, 40, or 65, 35, mm -hmm. weighted towards the guitar. Well, if you wouldn't mind playing something sure. um, uh, for us from Spring Awakening, yeah. you're going to do, I think. I'll do, I'll do the first Mama Who Bore Me, just, you know, just Great. keep it Great. short and sweet. Hopefully. Okay, <laughs> terrific. <laughs> so we can now. All right, so we're going to do, do the move, everybody. Uh, so this is Mama Who Bore Me, the opening number of Spring Awakening. <laughs> Mama who bore me, Mama who gave me No way to handle things, who made me so bad Mama the weeping, Mama the angels No sleep in heaven, a bed Some pray that one day Christ will come a calling. They light a candle and hope that it glows. And some just lie there crying for him to come and find them. But when he comes, they don't know how to go. Mama, the angels, 
no sleep in heaven. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, it was worth the wait, eight years, I think. <laughs> Duncan Sheik, it's a pleasure. Thank you so the much. show is Spring Awakening at uh, what theater you're at? The, the Eugene uh, O'Neill. At the Eugene O'Neill. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Doc. My pleasure. Good night. Thank you very much. Give me that hand, please, and the itch you can't control. Let me teach you how to handle all the sadness in your soul. Oh, we'll work that silver magic, then we'll